Good afternoon, students. Uh, we are here to talk about the pain relieving medicines because uh, that is what was left in your curriculum to cover. So today I am here to talk about antipyretic, analgesic and anti-inflammatory drugs. As you all know, the pain is an unpleasant experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage. And nowadays, you know, we have pain physicians, especially who are dealing with the uh, uh, ways so that, uh, the, so that patients can be relieved of pain because pain significantly hampers the quality of life. So pain relief becomes one of the utmost duties and responsibilities of you as physicians. So in my present lecture series, we would be uh, dealing with the pain relieving drugs and they would be comprising of two types basically. One would be the peripheral pain relievers and the other would be the central pain relievers. The central pain relievers, as you all know, one of the classical examples is morphine, but central pain relievers are fraught with problems of uh, dependence, abuse and tolerance. So we have other pain relievers which might not be as strong as the opioids, but yes, they can take care of mild to moderate pain. So as physicians, as healers, we have to see that patients don't wince in pain. And even patients who are having terminal pain associated with cancer, they should not wish death because they are having pain or they are feeling too much of pain. So here with students, I would like to enlighten you about the pain relieving drugs. Pain, as you know, is an unpleasant experience. And as you know, we are going to begin with the peripheral pain relievers and to top the list of the most efficacious peripheral pain relievers are the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. We would be covering the topic under the indications of NSAIDs, what is their mechanism of action, what is the role of COX-1 and COX-2, what are the class side effects of NSAIDs and individual side effects and how do you select a particular NSAID for a particular given condition. These drugs are also called antipyretic, analgesic and anti-inflammatory drugs. When we are telling them that they are anti-inflammatory drugs, we mean to contrast them with the uh, corticosteroids because corticosteroids also are anti-inflammatory but they are not classical antipyretic or analgesic agents and we also try to uh, compare the antipyretic analgesic drugs with um, what do you say uh, morphine like drugs because they are just pain relievers the morphine like drugs they are not anti-inflammatory so as we know that everybody has some quality so similarly the NSAIDs which we are going to learn today have very good analgesic activity and a very fairly decent to very nice anti-inflammatory activity so that makes these drugs very unique and as I told, mentioned earlier, that pain control is one of the most important therapeutic priorities of the physician. As you see, this is the nociceptive pathway, the ascending nociceptive pathways and the descending inhibitory pathways. You see that NSAIDs, I told you, are peripheral pain relievers. That means they do not act at the spinal or the supraspinal level where the opiates act, you know. The opiates are, we say, are the God's own medicine and they can relieve any kind of pain, the opiates. But same cannot be told for NSAIDs because they are acting on the peripheral pathway and they have less permeation across the blood-brain barrier to for they to act as central or uh, central analgesics. So if you see the most important mediator in the periphery which triggers the pain sensation in man could be the release of the inflammatory mediators like bradykinin, like 5-hydroxytryptamine or prostaglandins. These inflammatory mediators contribute to pain, not only to the pain but also to the inflammation at the site of pain. And they actually are the beginners for the ascending pathway. The NSAIDs do 
nothing but they suppress the release or they suppress i would be right if i say that they suppress the formation of the prostaglandins i would not be wrong if i say that they suppress the or they inhibit the activity of the cyclooxygenase the cyclooxygenase is the enzyme which is responsible for the production of prostaglandins so if cyclooxygenase is inhibited the prostaglandins are not formed and thereby the ascending pathway with the prostaglandin would have participated by producing pain or inflammation is controlled to a large extent i would also like to make a mention of a special drug here which belongs to the nsaid category and all of you know about this drug is paracetamol paracetamol is used for pain relief it is also used as a weak anti inflammatory and it is used as an antipyretic paracetamol is unique in the way that it can cross the blood brain barrier it does have central actions because when we are talking about relief of fever or antipyresis in that case the drug has to reach the hypothalamus which is the thermoregulatory zone in the brain so paracetamol does reach that thermoregulatory zone it brings the elevated set point of temperature to normal and brings about a relief of the fever as far as the opiates are concerned which we are going to deal with my in my next series of talk they opioids also inhibit the ascending pain pathway and they modulate the descending inhibitory pathway so their action is basically central and because they have a central action they have a stronger action but they have a central action they have a euphoric action they have a habit producing action they can cause respiratory depression and uh, that would be going negative as far as for targeting pain relief in patients is concerned so these are the effects of prostaglandins we are studying about the nsaids we are studying we have already talked about the fact the nsaids inhibit the prostaglandin production and that they do by inhibiting this very important enzyme the cyclooxygenase enzyme as you know that the substrate for the cyclooxygenase enzyme is obtained from the arachidonic acid and arachidonic acid which is formed in the membrane phospholipids this acid is acted upon by the enzyme phospholipase a2 and following the action of the phospholipase a2 the arachidonic acid products are diverted either to the cyclooxygenase pathway or the lipoxygenase pathway the cyclooxygenase pathway is responsible for the production of prostaglandins the lipoxygenase pathway is responsible for the production of leukotrienes so at this point of time we leave the leukotrienes aside we are going to deal with that shortly but let me tell you something about the prostaglandins the prostaglandins you know they are a double edged sword they do form they do have very important functions to play in the body that means they participate in the housekeeping functions they are responsible for the mucus production of the stomach they form the cytomucoprotective barrier of the stomach so that the uh, irritants uh, which we ingest are not unduly causing any ulcerations which include the drugs also the cyclooxygenase production of prostaglandin is responsible for kidney function so much so that many diuretics like furosemide they act by augmentation of the prostaglandin synthesis and that brings about intrarenal vasodilatation which is very important for the functions of the kidney and as you all know at the time of parturition when the lady is ready for labor it is the release of the prostaglandins which augments or which increases the labor contractions for facilitating the delivery so these are the effects of prostaglandins and of course prostaglandin release in the brain is is a marker for rise in temperature prostaglandin release in the joint cavity might be signaling a joint inflammation 
So when we give the NSAIDs, we are blocking the functions of prostaglandins. We do block the pathological functions of prostaglandins. That means fever is controlled. The joint inflammation subsides to a large extent or any other inflammation anywhere in the body. But at the same time, students, you must remember that it interferes with the normal physiology of the body so that the mucus production suffers. Patient has a lot of GIT stress, GIT erosions, GIT ulcers with prostaglandin inhibitors. His kidney functions kind of get compromised. There is sodium and water retention and that is not a good thing to happen for your kidneys. And in case you are ladies who are pregnant, their labor may be prolonged if they are given these NSAIDs. So nothing, no adverse drug reaction comes out of the blue. They are all related to the pharmacological effects of these drugs which are called the NSAIDs. This is a repetition of what we already taught and wherever there is a tissue injury or a noxious stimuli, it is leading to inflammation and that inflammation causes release of prostaglandins and these prostaglandins as you know are one of the important mediators of pain and this is the prostaglandin production we are trying to suppress with the use of our NSAIDs. In fact you know the NSAIDs are too too many in number and you know there might be about 20 or 30 NSAIDs which are available in the market and mind you they form an important part of the prescription for any physician. So we need to know not only their beneficial effects, but we also need to know that they could be harmful. They are also called aspirin-like drugs. In short, they are called the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. If you compare them with the opioid analgesics, which are used for moderate to severe pain, they are addictive, like morphine and pithidine. These drugs are not addictive. No, neither do they cause the respiratory depression, which we see with the opioids. If you compare with paracetamol, the other NSAIDs, uh, they, uh, paracetamol as compared to other NSAIDs is very, very safe drug to use. Over and above, it has good analgesic activity, but it has less anti-inflammatory activity. So if you are giving paracetamol for treatment of joint inflammation, for rheumatic carditis, you would not be able to help the patient much because it has very poor anti-inflammatory activity and if you talk about as a class most of the NSAIDs are organic acids. You see this beautiful tree and this tree is the willow tree and in the ancient past you know aspirin was obtained from the bark of the willow tree. Aspirin is one of the oldest and say we have with us. It is there with us since the 17th century. And it was a drug, the NSAID, which was used most commonly in the past for treatment of joint pains, for treatment of headaches, for treatment of other kinds of pain relief. But aspirin, you know, is very GIT toxic. It can cause a lot of GIT problems. It might not be tolerable to the patient to take it in analgesic doses or inflammatory doses. But yes, aspirin is one of the remarkable, remarkable discoveries of mankind because aspirin nowadays is not used for relief of inflammation or relief of fever so much so as it, as it is used as a low dose preparation, low dose aspirin. It is used for the prevention of adverse coronary events. If you see a prescription of any 50 plus old patient, your uncle or your grandfather or your parents, aspirin is a low dose aspirin which is given or dispensed in many prescriptions and the aim of that is to prevent adverse coronary event. But aspirin if you classify is a prototype drug of the NSAID category that is the bar from which we get aspirin and we call it the nature's aspirin because now we are able to even synthesize large amounts of aspirin in the laboratory so we do get the synthetic aspirin. So as I told you it is a very old drug it was used 
the bark of willow tree was used and it was used to relieve fever and that has been attributed to one of the oldest Hippocrates. And soon it was used for rheumatic fever, inflammation relief, gout inflammation relief, or it was used as a pain reliever. Until and foremost, you know, when the things come on your own, Hoffman is credited for actually uh, making aspirin in a more tolerable form because, you know, he loved his father so much. His father was having a lot of difficulty because of arthritic inflammation and pain. And he did something. He was a chemist at a Bayer laboratory. He sought to improve the adverse effect profile of salicylic acid. Salicylic acid is nothing but aspirin. Hoffman came across the earlier work of the French chemist Gerard, who had acetylated salicylic acid in 1853. Hoffman then began testing acetyl salicylic acid in animals in 1899, the first time that a drug was tested on animals in an industrial setting and proceeded soon thereafter to human studies and marketing of aspirin. So one person who was involved for purifying aspirin, for increasing its tolerability profile was Hoffman. That was the history of aspirin. Let us come back to the history of paracetamol. History of paracetamol is not so glorious as aspirin. The generic name of paracetamol is acetaminophen and it was first used in medicine by a discoverer, his name was von Mering in 1893, who recognized it as a major active metabolite of an acid. Paracetamol was employed in analgesic mixtures, you know, until implicated in the analgesic abuse nephropathy. You know, laborers during the First World War they feel tired, they felt fatigue and they used to consume this mixture which was called the APC mixture. What what is called APC where A stand for aspirin, V stand for phenacetin and C stood for caffeine. Caffeine you know is a CNS stimulant. You know, whenever we get tired or we feel sleepy, we tell, okay, let us have a cup of coffee. And we do feel rejuvenated after that. So why not would the laborers feel free from their aches, free from their boredom if they consume this mixture? This was the APC mixture. This mixture, you know, was addictive. It contained caffeine, it contained paracetamol. Both the drugs have a pen penetrability across the blood-brain barrier. Paracetamol is associated with euphoria. Although the studies uh, associating paracetamol with euphoria are still lacking. But paracetamol is addictive to an extent in the present era. In our adverse drug reaction monitoring center, we find many people who come with irreversible damage to the kidneys because they have been consuming an NSAID for as long as 15 to 20 years. So that says it all. And once a moment it was recognized that this analgesic abuse nephropathy is because of this mixture, APC mixture, which contained phenacetin, which was nothing but acetaminophen, which is nothing but paracetamol. It was withdrawn in the 1980s and it was good to withdraw that mixture. As far as the chemical classification of the NSAIDs goes, they can be, all of them are organic acids. They get absorbed nicely in the stomach because they remain ionized in the stomach. And some of the organic acids like aspirin, they undergo the phenomena which is called ion trapping, that they trap in self, itself in the gastric mucosal cell, ionize inside the gastric mucosal cell with the respect that once they get ionized inside the cell, they have no way, they cannot come out of the cell. So once they cannot come out of the cell, they cause damage to the cell. And that is one of the reasons for aspirin and many other NSAIDs causing direct GIT toxicity or direct gastrointestinal toxicity. So that we would leave, uh, have more emphasis when we do the side effects. But here let us come to the classification of NSAIDs. Aspirin, sodium salicylate, diphenyl, they are the salicylic acid 
derivatives commonly used. Then we have ketorolac, indomethacin, nabimeton, diclofenac, which are acetic acid derivatives. You must have heard of the drug ibuprofen, you know. You take it for any pain relief, you take it for any swelling, you take it for any musculoskeletal injury. It belongs to the category of propionic acid derivatives. And then we have mephenemic acid. Only one drug is available, that is meclofenamate. And then we have a drug which was launched with a lot of pomp and show, but no longer available now because it was associated with side effects, are the COX-2 inhibitors. We do have the longer acting NSAIDs, which are peroxicam and meloxicam. And finally, paracetamol. Acetaminophen. This is the chemical classification, students. And we do have classification based on the Cox selectivity also. What is the classification of Cox selectivity? That some of them are non-selective Cox inhibitors. That means their uh, dot would be somewhere which will be unselective. Some would be more Cox2 selective and some would be more Cox1 selective. There's a reason to classify them based on their Cox selectivity and I will be just dealing about it with you now. So these are the Cox2 inhibitors, meloxicam, diclofenac, selecoxib, valdecoxib, itodolac, rofecoxib, itoricoxib and lumiracoxib and uh, they are no longer used as I said the Cox2 selective NSAIDs are put in red because they have a difficulty as far as their use is concerned. Not because they are not efficacious. Not because they are not efficacious. But they were associated with unexpected, uncalled for, adverse coronary events in the form of stroke, myocardial infarction also, hypertension also, that they have been withdrawn. At least a red one, selecoxib, valdecoxib, rofecoxib, itoricoxib and lumiricoxib have been withdrawn. This is a classification based on half-life. You should know which are the drugs which are longer acting because you would like to dose your patient just once a day with a longer acting agent which is meloxicam, neproxicam, peroxicam and nabimeton. And then we have the shorter acting ones like diclofenac which have to be dosed every 6 to 8 hours and uh, ibuprofen which also has a similar half-life of between 2 to 6 hours and uh, the longer acting ones. Difficult to remember the names of all of them, I understand, but yes, you should know the spectrums, you know, people always remember the extremes. This person is good, this person is not so good. So extremes are always remembered, so why don't we do that too? They all have a similar characteristic that they inhibit the biosynthesis of prostaglandins. And as I told you, this is the prostaglandin synthesis pathway. The arachidonic acid, which is derived from membrane phospholipid, is acted upon by the enzyme phospholipase A2 and diverted into two pathways, the epoxygenase pathway, which is responsible for the production of leukotrienes, which are the inflammatory mediators for bronchoconstriction, that they produce bronchial asthma, and cyclooxygenases, which produce the prostaglandins, which not only have functions for inflammation, but they also have the housekeeping functions. So uh, this is all for just the beginning and we would definitely now be continuing uh, with the further mechanism and what is the difference between COX-1 and COX-2, how does it transform to utility, how does it transform to GID side effects. Thank you so much students.